the love of money, a topic that every Christian and professing Christian alike should know very well. And I'm looking forward to talking about a natural lesson today, but also a spiritual lesson that we can all take away from this, the love of money. Please look at the screen or turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 6 through 10. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lust, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. My commentary would be, going back to verse 6, uh, Godliness with contentment is great gain. When I got saved, the Lord changed me completely. I'll give my own brief testimony. Prior to being saved, I was on a very successful career path, looking forward to a promotion uh, with great responsibilities, reporting to a chief operating officer of a company that had uh, facilities in and outside of the United States. Uh, God changed me. Uh, I was fortunate to uh, discover God's Word and start reading it on business trips, and uh, it, it completely pierced my soul and changed my life and the way that I look at everything forever and ever. Uh, being born again was a very powerful experience, uh, so it, it ch changed my affections from natural to spiritual. And I realize that when the Lord says, we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out, everybody has the same net worth to God. None of us are taking anything with us. And for the short time that we're here, we need to be good custodians or caretakers of the resources that he gives us. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. In other words, you know, the basics of being able to survive, be content with that. The Holy Ghost should convert people to have that conviction because if we don't have the Holy Spirit inside of us, we are going to again have these infirmities of the flesh. Our natural affections are going to be such that God's telling us that our nature is you always want more, whether it's money, whether it's sex, whether it's the praise of men. You get a little, and you want more, and you keep wanting more and more. Also, that works in terms of understanding who God is. You, you start becoming wise in your own conceits, and you, you start thinking of yourself as something special. And if you're not being taught by the Holy Spirit on the pure word of God, there's a slippery slope and a snare there. And some of the key words here, like pierce themselves, uh, to me, that is, the, the word pierce is a thread common throughout Scripture to, to describe Antichrist. Um, you know, we know that we can be a, a drunkard if we lean on Antichrist. We can get our, I believe it says, hands pierced uh, in, in, in the Bible. And it also says, Leviathan, the Antichrist, is a piercing serpent. And it also says that Lucifer, his nose pierceth through snares. So, you don't want to be pierced with many sorrows. And uh, I'm going to discuss today the love of money, financial vocabulary. This is my own personal notes. These are my own personal notes that I'm going to share. Again, I encourage everyone to make your own uh, notes based on what the Lord has taught you. Uh, working to survive and being content. Uh, Lucifer's evil, which you know is important to understand if we're talking about the love of money being the root of all evil. And I'll give a brief conclusion. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, it says, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. God is reminding us of our fallen human nature in the flesh. We always want more. More silver than what we have, more money than what we have, more of everything than what we have. We have, uh, a lot of us, a greedy nature. 
uh, and God calls that vanity, and and I believe Solomon was the prophet here. Uh, he's a great example of uh, being made foolish because he thought of himself being special because he was wealthy, and he started forgetting about God's commandments and started, you know, going after his own lust. In Matthew chapter 6, it says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Uh, there's a spiritual and a natural lesson there. Uh, God doesn't, you know, put any great credence on how much we are accumulating in terms of physical possessions because everything in this world is, is decaying anyway. We're in a state of decay. Um, and what Jesus is speaking to the Christians about is uh, the treasures in heaven that you should lay up. That's the, the wisdom, understanding, and faith from the word of God as the Holy Spirit teaches us. That is durable, and that is going to go with us to our judgment and will be rewarded in some way for that uh, for an eternity. So that's what God places credence on. Uh, and today, natural people don't understand that. And they seem, you know, not everyone, but a lot of people seem to just have no end in sight. Their love of the praise of men, their love of money, their love of, of vices and things like that. Um, you know, how nice of a car do you need? Are you content with... A basic car, or do you need one that's souped up? Do you need a Rolls Royce or a Bentley? You know, how much home do you need? Do you need a thousand square feet? Is two thousand enough, or is a mansion of twenty thousand square feet uh, going to satisfy your needs? It, it it never ends for some people, you know. And the big reward that we have as Christians is eternal life in the kingdom of heaven, and Lucifer, the god of this world, wants to be like God, so uh, has God allowed a delusion to be sent to people that they can have eternal life some other way than, than the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is cloning something that's been sold to people? And if so, does the devil have enough power to deceive the whole world and use cloning as one means of beguiling people into thinking they're going to have eternal life apart from how God says it's going to happen. Uh, so th that's a rhetorical question as far as I'm concerned, but it's something that I think people should think about. Um, and just consider the delusions that are being sent and why it's important to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so that God can remove those delusions and fill us with his wisdom rather than our own. It says in Ezekiel chapter 22, Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey, to shed blood and to destroy souls, to get dishonest gain. On a natural level, there are people that get dishonest gain. They steal, they manipulate markets, they make money or gain in a dishonest fashion. And for that reason, you know, because of that, we've got laws that punish criminals. My personal opinion is the biggest offenders here, in a natural sense, are also the commercial Christians, the ones that are uh, going in, and some of them may be very well intended, but going in to turn a profit off of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Word of God and what the Holy Spirit teaches, and it becomes a slippery slope and a snare. Uh, they start getting positive feedback from people. They start getting a lot of views or they sell their merchandise, and it just fuels a never-ending fire, making them think that there's something special when Jesus Christ tells all of us, without him we can do nothing. And, uh, and so... My thought is dishonest gain happens on a natural level there and a spiritual level. You start, you don't sell God's wisdom. It says buy the truth and sell it not. You're selling your own wisdom, which is going to, for those that are actually true Christians, going to be counted as loss at the judgment seat of Christ. And for those that really aren't born again at all, that's going to just add their, 
to their punishment in the lake of fire by, you know, deceiving people, you know, getting them to believe in a false Christ and a false testimony. And how many Bibles, lexicons, and Christian celebrities are enough? It's a question that I think probably every born-again believer has maybe pondered at some point. But do you really need all this stuff? Do you really need to go to the bookstore and buy apologetics when God says you need not that any man teach you, but the anointing which he gives us, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, will lead us to all truth. And then you can edify one another based on your spiritual gifts. That's God's plan. He does the work. So why do we need to go to the markets to buy apologetics? I would say they're, for the most part, completely unnecessary. Sometimes things like concordances can be helpful to identify where certain words appear in Scripture, and that's all completely verifiable. But you get into lexicons and, and explanations from people that have copyrighted their apologetics to get gain, and you start stepping into a snare. So what we want to do is put our trust in Jesus Christ and his word and his truth to avoid this. I'm putting up my own financial vocabulary. Again, these are my notes. I study my Bible uh, probably. I just don't read. I study extensively, and I make notes to myself, and I don't expect anybody to believe one thing on this screen. But I'm sharing a concept so that everybody watching this video can pray and make your own notes based on what the Holy Spirit has taught you. Words that appear in the far left column uh, are applicable to the love of money. I've got revenue, rich, poor, money, penny, treasure, gold, silver, buy, sell, merchandise, tribute. These are all financial terms in the Bible. And there is a natural synonym that I put there for myself. And then there is a spiritual meaning that I documented for myself that I had been taught by the Lord after prayer. I pray about this as I read my Bible. And then I make notes of verses. I like to put two or three verses in there. I ran out of room a little bit. But this helps me be refreshed at times. The Holy Spirit does the work. But when I'm reading a testimony, I'm getting a spiritual lesson as well as a natural lesson. So I'm, I'm just talking about this briefly um, and and I think that uh, for me, it, it opens up, God opens up very powerful spiritual lessons here. So I'm going to go on and say, are we wise with our natural money? If the love of money is the root of all evil, are we wise right now with our natural money? Housing, food, transportation, and health. As Christians, we should be good stewards of what we've been given um, and not covet things. And... Uh, you know, how, how we go about using the resources that God gives us is important. Are we wise with what we have been given on a spiritual level? I would submit to everyone, there's much more credence on this because we're spiritual creatures in Christ if we're born again. How's our faith? Do we really believe the Bible? And what Bible? for that matter, because the market's flooded with seemingly countless versions. And are we sharing with people? Are we witnessing to people? It doesn't do us any good. It doesn't profit us if we don't share what God has taught us with others. Um, Jesus uh, made many loaves of bread out of just a small amount. Uh, and it's a lesson for us to share his word, that he will provide spiritual food for those that will believe on him. And then I put down here Luke chapter 12. I encourage everyone to read. There's a couple of brief parables there about uh, being wise in a spiritual sense and giving spiritual food or meat to your household and being a wise steward of what God has given us. So I'm not going to get into that, but if you want, please pray about it and go read Luke chapter 12. And I called out some specific verses there that apply to this particular subject matter. Working to eat, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. For even when we were with you, 
This we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. The lesson I take away here is, on a natural level, God doesn't want people to sit around and be lazy. Certainly there are exceptions where some people just can't work for whatever reason. Uh, and work doesn't necessarily mean that you're only getting money. Work could be a responsibility of someone taking care of others or taking care of children or doing something productive. But the lesson here is certainly very clear that God wants people to, on a natural level, work in order to get their money to purchase food or work to be able to eat. Okay? It says in Psalm 141, Incline not my heart to any evil thing to practice wicked works with men that work iniquity and let me not eat of their dainties. So on a spiritual level, this whole lesson is revealed to be, um, you know, Working, the Holy Spirit for Christians does the work. F work is, is faith w without works is dead. If you're a true believer, God tries you and he tries your works of faith. It's a different lesson, but true believers are sealed until the day of redemption. And uh, it's revealed here that spiritually, if you don't work, you don't eat. If you're not born again of the Spirit, you're not eating the spiritual food, the manna from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, flesh and drinking his blood that saves people so that they have eternal life. What you're doing is you're working iniquity because you're still in the flesh and not in the spirit because you're eating the dainties, the false corrupt scriptures of Babylon ultimately is the lesson here. So we want to work to eat. If we eat the flesh of Jesus spiritually, the Holy Spirit has done the work by trying our faith. God has tried our faith. And I wanted to share that with everyone because there is a natural and a spiritual lesson here. Wealth and outcomes, it says in Psalm 49, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. There's not anybody on earth that has any net worth that's going to get anywhere with God. It's all his anyway. He says the gold is his and the silver is his. So we're all just temporary uh, custodians of what he's created. Men divide among ourselves, you know, money based on, you know, what we feel money is worth based on what we do. And there's people that get money in a dishonest fashion. Uh, so being hardworking to get money is important. But when money becomes a snare and people start trusting in their wealth and boasting of how much gain they've made on a natural sense and even on a spiritual sense, it's not going to do any good because you must be born again and none of us are taking anything out of this world with us to judgment. It says in Luke chapter 14, So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus says, on the other hand, you have to be able to forsake all, all to be his disciple. So he's speaking not only naturally, but spiritually. You have to empty yourself of everything that you thought was right or wrong and put your trust completely on Jesus Christ to build you back up and fill you with his wisdom and understanding because of faith. So there is a natural lesson here where you have to forsake all and only God can try a person there. Only he can measure whether a person has truly done that to be the disciple of Jesus Christ. You have to be emptied out and filled up with the Lord's wisdom as well. You have to let go of what you think uh, your own wisdom is and trust God to fill you up with his. God speaks about Lucifer. The subject here is the love of money is the root of all evil. And we know, we should know as Christians, how we fell in the Garden of Eden. We were beguiled by the serpent because we engaged in a conversation with a being or a creation that is 
far, far above our capabilities and intelligence levels. It's God tells us in Isaiah chapter 14, speaking about Lucifer, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So we learn uh, why Lucifer fell. And one of the reasons is because he wanted to ascend above the heights of the clouds. The clouds on a spiritual level, not just a natural level, but a spiritual level, represent the prophets. He thought of himself as being so wise, he was above God's word on a spiritual level. He wanted to be like the Most High. He wanted to be like God. He got kicked out of heaven. He's the God of this earth, the God of this world. And, uh, you know, until we're born again of the Spirit, we're, we're under a delusion. He, is, uh, he, is, he has blinded us, and only God can open the eyes of the blind. Continuing on, it says in Ezekiel chapter 28, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the mist of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the mist of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by the reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Lucifer was full of himself. He leaned on his own wisdom. He trusted in his own brightness. And it was corrupt. And he loved not only money on a natural level, having uh, all this merchandise, but he loved his own wisdom on a spiritual level. He was proud, boastful, pompous, uh, and a reflection of that can be seen in apostate Christianity today. Um, you know, look at anyone trying to turn a prophet for their own gain by using the name of Jesus Christ, and you'll find a slippery slope there. And so this is a, an important lesson on the love of money. So in conclusion, it says in Proverbs chapter 28, The rich man is wise in his own conceit, but the poor that hath understanding searcheth him out. Poor people have a contrite spirit. They've been born again on a spiritual level. Now they're certainly rich and poor on a natural level, and some people are poor, and it's their own fault. There's no question there. Um, but spiritually, if you're rich in this sense, it's because you're so proud, you're so wise, you think of yourself so highly that you just never receive the truth of God's word. And because you've never sought out God, you've never put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Romans, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And God's continuing this lesson that if you read the word of God, First of all, it's you have to seek out the Word of God. If you read and you have any doubt in your heart, well, I, I, I mostly believe this, but I, I'm not sure about this. Uh, and, and I pick and choose what I want to believe out of God's Word because it doesn't make sense. This, this, these couple of verses don't make sense to me, so there must have been scribal errors. If, if a person is in that mindset, how can they ever get saved? Because they're not eating of faith. They're not consuming the spiritual food, with faith and trust in God. And God, his word is spoken and written such that it doesn't necessarily please our natural understanding all the time. There's plenty of uh, scripture and verses that I struggled with at times until I accepted by faith the truth and I prayed and asked God to reveal to me what is it that he means. Why would a man have breast filled with milk? You know, what about this verse? What about this verse? Some things just don't make sense. But then the Holy Spirit, if you have faith, he will lead you to all truth according to God. You have to trust Jesus Christ. So in conclusion, the love of money is both a literal and spiritual lesson. The root of all evil, loving money, gold, silver, treasures, 
and one's own wisdom and understanding, rather than God's. Few really believe God's word. It's one thing to have a natural love of money. That's temporal. Uh, this earth is passing away. However, if a person uh, loves their own wisdom and never accepts the truth of God's word and never receives the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, they're going to have an eternity of punishment that is going to be so horrifying, it's, it's hard to think about at times. So I wanted to cover this topic, and um, I hope this is helpful to some people. Uh, it is certainly a core topic that every Christian and professing Christian alike should study and have a good understanding of. Thank you for watching and listening.